today we're here to celebrate the debut of this new exhibition, Five Exclamation Points, by Rachel Jones, curated by Erin Genoa Gilbert. So today we'll be treated to a conversation between these two. And Five Exclamation Points premieres a series of vivid oil pastel landscapes which continue Jones's ongoing exploration into black interiority and personhood. Following solo museum exhibitions in the UK and China, this is the first solo museum exhibition for Jones in the United States. It is now my honor to introduce our two guests. Working in painting, installation, sound, and performance, Rachel Jones explores a sense of self as a visual, visceral experience. Her paint, in her painting, she grapples with the challenges of finding visual means to convey abstract, existential concepts. The figure is notably abstracted in her works as Joan is, Jones is interested in using motifs and colors as a way to communicate ideas about the interiority of black bodies and their lived experience. Erin Genoa Gilbert is a New York-based curator and art advisor specializing in post-war and contemporary art. She holds a BA in political science and a BA in African and African American studies from the University of Michigan and an MA in contemporary art from the University of Manchester. With a focus on abstract, conceptual, and sculptural practices, Gilbert is informed by her own migrations between the US, Africa, and Europe, and has conjured a curatorial practice that examines the physical and psychological connection to land, the trauma of displacement, and the black female body as contested terrain. Join me in welcoming our guests. Hello, thank you all for joining us today. It is an absolute pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you to Manetta, to Kijo, to the entire um, MOAD team for welcoming us and for having us here. Um, Rachel, thank you, obviously, for your contribution to this entire process. The works that are on view are absolutely phenomenal. I'm very excited to be able to talk about them today. And thank you to your mother also for joining us all the way from the UK. It's great to have an ongoing a support network in this process. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about a few things. We wanna talk about the ideas and influences that um, Rachel has been addressing over her artistic practice. We'll talk a little bit about the material and methods in which she uses to make these paintings. And then we'll talk about her relationship to other practices such as music and performance and the ways in which those are connected overall. I want to start out by thinking about a quote um, from a Guardian article that was written in 2015, where you were working at the time in a more figurative way. The works that we're looking at now really oscillate, I think, between figuration and abstraction. But in 2015, you said, all the work I've been making for this past couple of years is about the replication of the black figure in the history of art and contemporary society. It is a massive subject, and my most recent paintings are focused on representation of violence and sexuality within the black community. And I refer to things I've read from the 1700s and 1800s. I use color and energy as a person to alleviate some of the seriousness and darkness of the subject matter because I want the paintings to be accessible and for people to engage with them. I'm attracted to things that are intense. I like it when you can feel the real presence of a person who has made a work within the painting. And I, the energy, the color, this idea of personhood, um, can you talk a little bit about your early work and how those ideas were manifested then? Yeah, um, I don't know, it's interesting, I've not, it's so funny, yeah, yeah, it's like nearly a decade ago. Um, yeah, I think that there's something interesting about the, um, the space that can be given to people to come to the work on their own terms and there's so much that people will bring with them when they're looking at things. But I'm interested in that and the space that runs parallel where I try to imbue the work with things that I'm concerned with. And I think when those two things meet, there's like a generation of a conversation or a sharing and a feeding and a taking in, but also like a release. And I, I feel like I've learned over the years how to direct that process through associating certain relationships with color and emotion 
as a sort of modus operandi for the ideas I have around the interior landscapes we have, the way we embody ourselves or the way maybe we think we exist and how that might be at odds with how we're seen or how we present. And yeah, all of these things kind of operate simultaneously. Um, and it's a journey for me, I think, as an artist in sometimes getting closer to the essence of these things, but then also sometimes moving away from them to explore other ideas. But I would say that's been a really important foundation for the work and how I approach making things. It's interesting because color is obviously one of the strongest elements, I think, of your practice. The reds in particular. Yes. The gold, the yep. yellow. Um, those colors tend to be present throughout the bodies of work that I've seen, especially yep. over the last few years. Can you talk a little bit about color and how that intensity matters and how you have used that? Yeah. Um, I think I have a very, uh, like, sensorial relationship to color. Like, I associate color with bodily responses that are to do with taste or touch and I don't know it's hard to explain but basically I am interested in how to draw out the very strong emotional value that colors have for me and how to create compositions with the painting or relationships between colors in the paintings where they enact a certain personality or they have a, or the colors have um, maybe a personhood or something similar to identity or agency. And sometimes I think with these works, it's interesting because they're far less chaotic than paintings I've made in the past. And my interest in like tension and frenetic energy is something which has been rooted in my relationship to color and it feeling very alive and urgent and lived and something that is forever changing and it's like being enacted and in motion but with these paintings I think my relationship has shifted into something where the colors are more established and fixed or they hold space in a more solid way or more permanent way like they're not moving as much as they normally do and they hold like distinct spaces from one another and that's also something that happens because so much of the linen is left visible. So there is a color that is um, inherently active in and of itself. Like I'm not doing anything to the linen. It's just the, the grain, the weave, the tone of it adds to the relationship that exists with the other colors in the work. And it becomes as much a part of the work as like a distinct thing that operates separately to it. So yeah, I, I'm always trying to develop but also understand maybe what my relationship to color is because it feels like it's always morphing but it's really important and I think it's also quite maybe quite spiritual in a way where there's a lot of symbolism that can be applied to colors and the importance of color in black culture and the way we use it and the way we're drawn to it and as, as a mode of self-expression it's something that really for me represents um like a form of language and yeah I don't know yeah no absolutely um you've already begun to speak about linen which you know is important for us to address in this conversation in, in part because it's your first body of work that you've made on linen you've yeah. been working on canvas prior so yeah linen in and of itself is giving you a sense of another color yeah and we'll talk about the negative space later but what made you want to move from canvas to linen in this moment in this particular body of work yeah, I I think with each body of work, there's always a development in the ideas or the way I want to use my material. So the oil, all of these paintings are made with oil pastels and oil sticks. So there's very much a relationship to drawing in how I think about making the paintings. And I wanted to think about the way I was using space or the way I was creating areas of depth or liminal space in the paintings. And instead of covering them completely, which is what I would do with all my canvas works, um, I wanted there to be breathing space or for there to be a, a tone that is used as a leaping point for everything. And with the canvas paintings, the leaping point would be color. So I would work in a way where if I had a canvas, whether it was unstretched or stretched, 
I would cover the complete surface with lots of random colors. And then from that, I would start to develop areas of pattern and texture. And slowly I would figure out where I would like my motif of teeth or lips to appear. So the whole process is very intuitive, but it was working from a place of responding to color as the kind of spark or like the catalyst for everything. Whereas with this work, I wanted there to be a different starting point and that for me meant thinking about space differently and using like a different set of, I suppose, formal techniques to think about how I think about the mouth within the context of the canvas, like how much um, it takes up the canvas or how small it might be or how it might take on like a different function in comparison to how it's been used before in the past. And here for me, like the linen and the way I've used it is kind of echoing my interest in shifting into making landscape paintings. Because for a while I was working in a portrait format with small works. And I wanted to think about making paintings that looked like there was a huge sky or there was a huge landscape that was really hard to take in. And then the mouth dominating that landscape and becoming um, like maybe a ridiculous, f like, f kind of body within that landscape or like a monstrous body or um, I don't know, something that was unreal, but felt like it had, had some kind of relationship to reality. Um, and so for some reason I felt like changing from canvas to linen presented this new way of looking and this new way of thinking. It was about providing myself like a fresh kind of outlook on the way I was thinking about my painting and it was as simple as just like changing the surface and sometimes I need things like that to help unlock certain parts of like my brain or like certain things I might have been like thinking about but too scared to try because I was so used to working in other ways. You've already touched now and shared with everyone that these are mouths they're looking at and talked about this idea already of landscape. And I think when we first met, I saw the work and I said to you, I thought about Marfa, I thought about Chinati, I thought about a series of mountain ranges and I thought that's what I was seeing before I learned that they were mouths. So you went from in your early work thinking about the figure to really focusing on the mouth and there are a series of exhibitions you all should acquire the exhibition catalogs for called Smile and Say Cheese and Mike's Tooth and um, A Shorn Root, any number of references to the mouth or to teeth and lips. Can you talk about how you got specifically from the idea of the black figure yep. into the mouth as the metaphor for the body and specifically the black body? Yeah, it was a very practical process in a way. Like I have always done a lot of life drawing, um, but I've, I mean, I've, at school, like I really had to learn how to draw properly. Um, and it was a big part of my course when I was studying in Glasgow. We had to do life drawing every Monday for about two years. And then you could opt out of it. But I continued to draw. And my relationship to drawing really, I think, um, feeds the process of how I paint. And I've always found painting quite serious and inaccessible. Like when I was a student, I always felt overwhelmed by the history of painting and how you had to have like a really strong position to be able to call yourself a painter. And you had to have a really specific lens and way of painting to call yourself a painter. But then at the same time, I was very aware of all this rejection of painting that had come before, you know, for like the past few decades, right? So I felt guilty and embarrassed about the fact that I wanted to be a painter. So I had a very troubled relationship with it and I actually struggled to make paintings quite a lot. So I would always, escape to drawing as a thinking place, as a place of learning, playing, discovering things. And there was no pressure. Like I never felt precious about my paintings or worried about what I was doing. And when I was life drawing, I started to think about it as a way to, to practice looking, which is what you're meant to be doing anyway, but thinking about it in a context of looking and thinking about abstraction and how I might draw the body in an abstract way whilst looking. And I started to hone in on certain areas of the body. And then I started to take oil pastels into the life drawing room. And I would make like, I had sketchbooks where all I would draw would be like feet 
or um, like shoulders or hands or genitalia. And it was this idea of focusing intently on a body part and then abstracting it with color and understanding shape and tone and the weight of my hand and all these things and how it could create like a completely new or alternate vision of the body. And so when I left Glasgow, I kind of was painting figuratively, but I started to slowly move into more like abstract forms of bodies and making caricatures of bodies and things like that. And then when I went to the RA, like I really threw myself into thinking about how I can paint in a way that had built on my relationship to drawing. And I started off with eyes um, and I was thinking about the emotional resonance that comes with the gaze, um, like the, the weight historically of the gaze in a racial context. Um, and I read a text um, by Hilton Owls, which was in a book about lynching. And he was speaking about um, the power of the gaze and how it was the precursor to becoming a nigger um, to a white person. And the gaze was the thing that happened before the lynching. And it was this idea of how a part of the body can be used as a way to communicate lots of different things to communicate care, love, concern, but also hate, um, suspicion, fear. And I was like, ah, oh, like I can talk about emotive things, things to do with my experience, things to do with what it's like to be a person in the world. And I can use a part of the body as a signifier, but I don't have to be explicit about what those things might mean. And those things can actually be multiple. So I started with eyes and then after that, I was like, what other part of the body could I use? And I was like, oh, maybe I'll try a mouth. And then when I did that, I was like, ah. Oh. And it all just seemed to make sense in a way that I hadn't been aware that I was seeking um, a form to work with. But I think over the years, slowly, 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 I've been chipping away at getting to a point where I could communicate succinctly, but very vastly, and for there to be space for people to come to the work and not to see necessarily anything I'm talking about, but for there to be things there if they started to look, so yeah. And it's interesting you say that because I'm thinking about gold teeth, I'm thinking about grills, I'm thinking about cavities, I'm thinking about all of those ways in which class and race can sometimes be seen through teeth. And I think sometimes even people think about certain geographies of having certain types of teeth. And now we have veneers and we have a kind of obsession with a perfect smile in the US. And um, what then does the mouth do for you that the eyes didn't do? Ooh, I think the mouth, the mouth is just more fun to paint, I, I would say. Um, that's part of it. Like there is a huge sense of like, play and when I'm making things and like d like experimenting because everything's made intuitively so I don't know what I'm gonna end up producing when I start a painting but um as a shape like it's just so satisfying and like playing around with ideas of what teeth look like exactly what you said like the the things that you can describe via the shape of a tooth and like how it can also look like a tombstone or a mountain or it can have like a relationship to other aspects in the painting that have nothing to do with the body. Like they just seem to be more ground to cover. And I think when I made the paintings about eyes, it, I was in a very specific space mentally and emotionally. And the eyes really represented what I wanted to discuss at that time. But there seemed to be um, like a very specific moment where that needed to be done and then it had passed. But then with the mouths, it's like, they just keep on like producing more and more for me to mine. Mm -hmm. And they, I won't make these paintings forever, do you know? So I don't know how long I will, but I'm still, I feel like I'm still learning so much because I've also only been working with oil pastels in this way since 2019. So I, I feel like I also don't understand so much about what I'm doing. Like, it, like I have like an awareness, but there is a mystery to the work and there is a sense of trying to find things out that I'm still like really like stuck in, which is good. Like it's a Very really good. nice place to be in, but yeah. yeah, I don't know. They just feel more generous in a way. 
I can say, having looked at a lot of abstraction over the years and thinking particularly about a generation of black women making abstraction, mm -hmm. that the fact that you have a specific point of entry mm -hmm. and a specific kind of motif and metaphor that you're addressing throughout all these bodies of work is extremely distinctive and part of why I was drawn to being able to work with you on a show and think about bringing this conversation to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. I also think this notion of agency yep. is something that's activated through the mouth in a way that actually with the gaze and in the way that you describe it being um, a moment before a certain kind of violence, yep. right? That yep this is a different, it is a more active rather than a passive yep. stance and knowing you and knowing how agency works within your you know, personhood yeah. right? and yeah. how important it is, particularly in a specific period of time, mm -hmm. I think for black women to have voice, to have agency, to yeah. be able to speak about and write about our experiences in our own authentic voice, uh -huh. it's really important to, to keep thinking through yeah. everything that this is giving you. So yeah. I'm very excited about that. No, it's really great. And I think also there's so much um, where, not so much with these works, I feel like they're quite figurative for me really. So there is a sense of the mouth really existing in the space quite clearly for me. I mean, it's different. I made them so I can see everything. But with the other works, there was a, there was a different experience where the mouth really receded into the space of the painting, but also came out of it. And there was this thing of not really knowing where you were looking into a mouth or looking out of it. And where you positioned yourself as a viewer in relationship to the painting, I think, maybe like psychologically or visually, like there wasn't a fixed point. And because the works were so um, layered in pattern and color, you always had to move around the painting. Like I wasn't very generous in allowing you to rest when you were looking. Mm -hmm. So there was a different type of demand in terms of how you had to engage with the work. And, but at the same time, they were so pleasurable in a way because they're so colorful and they're so enticing. So there's this thing of, using the agency I had as an artist, but also as someone that is thinking about experiences um, of black people and black women, not that I'm speaking on anyone's behalf, but my own, but understanding what it might mean to problematize someone's experience of engaging with something that has come from um, a specific experience or a specific place and not making it easy for people to just absorb stuff or assume things or dismiss things. And you can take the paintings at face value for just being like a colorful, like, array of patterns and things but then also at the same time there's something quite charged and um aggressive about them but alongside that something sweet and very like giving and like sumptuous and you know like there was a lot of back and back and forth I wanted there to be in the work and I think that's I kind of like I feel like that resembles what it's like to be a person. You, there's a back and forth of what it's like to exist. And the idea that you're never really in one position, you inhabit multiple realities, imagined, real, like societal, cultural, like historical, they're all happening at the same time. And maybe one is more present than another. And I, I want this idea of like the multiple or just like many to be part of the work. And yeah, that's kind of, I don't know, that's like a really important aspect of how I think about things just generally in life. You know, this idea of multiple actually is very interesting because I think of these as polyvocal mm. kind of spaces because each one of these is their own person, their own personality. And in that way, with some, so many of them now with these open gate mouths, right? These very, and we've talked about this before, but these very accentuated lips and accentuated teeth, a sky and a ground. Again, very different from the earlier works where you say the mouths receded into them. I think, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, your relationship to literature oh, yeah. and specifically um, some of the black women writers we talked about before and Kevin Quashy, Audre Lorde, but I think Elizabeth Alexander is someone who, um, this notion of black interiority, she coined, coined the term and she says, um, the black interior describes black life and creativity beyond the face, the public face and stereo of stereotype and limited imagination. 
The black interior is a metaphysical space beyond the black public every day toward power and wild imagination that black people ourselves know we possess but need to be reminded of. It is a space that black people ourselves have policed at various historical moments. And tapping into this black imaginary helps us envision what we are not meant to envision. Mm -hmm. Complex black selves, real and enactable black power, rampant and unfetishized black beauty. Mm. Can you talk to me about the black interior and how that? Yeah, I mean, that's so, I mean, it's so well put and I think um, reading Sovereignty of Quiet um, by Kevin Koshy, um, it just really presented, presented to me an intellectual description of something that I knew and understood, but I hadn't found a context for understanding it in a way that is to do with like a historical prioritizing of self that black people have always been engaged with. Mm. But it's like things come to you at the right time, I think in terms of like information. And I received that text at a moment where I was trying to think about how to make abstract paintings about the self, but I didn't feel like people necessarily would ever really understand my interest in that or would be concerned with that because what I understood about abstraction from growing up was always about an external, sublime, other, mm, mm. removed relationship to abstraction. And I wanted to think about a lived emotional relationship to abstraction because to a huge extent, like, your emotional, spiritual, psychic life is entirely abstract. So there, it, it's like it made sense, but like I didn't know how to make it sense, make sense visually. And reading Kevin's work and then things by Gwendolyn Brooks and Alice Walker and Toni Morrison, like just the queen really, I think, of abstraction and relationship to like an emotional life, a lived life, a psychic life, um, a material life. There was this like slow development in my confidence in feeling like I could attempt these things and that I should, like it was important that I, that I prioritize these things. And so I was able slowly to feel, feel my way through my relationship to my interiority as something that was deeply, deeply felt it was joyful, it was rooted in sadness, in anxiety, in pleasure, all of these things. And I felt like, oh, well, I'm obsessed with color and I know how I relate emotionally to color. So maybe I can use that as a vessel for some of these feelings or ideas. And then slowly, slowly, form started to come into the picture and obviously I told you how I was thinking about well maybe I could use the body in some way so all of these things happened like you know like at a relatively slow pace in a way but it gave me enough time to grow into the confidence I needed to make the work because there was something very um difficult about feeling like I had the right to make this type of work because it I don't know there's a huge thing I think about as being a woman artist um, that, you know, it's not good to make art that talks from a space of emotion. Like, I'm very emotionally intelligent. And when you're at school, you're not encouraged to speak about work from that place. You have to have a formal relationship to the work. You have to have a distant relationship to the work and be able to critique it in a way that is only intellectual um, in an academic sense. And so I felt really disenfranchised in the knowledge that I have because I have a wealth of emotional intelligence and I didn't feel like I could speak from that place but when I realized that it was important that I just trusted myself and trusted the things that I was finding and realizing oh people do like work like this though I was sort of like yeah just like leapt into it and then the work kind of materialized really out of nowhere I was kind of like oh my god I don't, don't understand what I'm making but like I was like oh but it, it makes sense in some sort of way in like a deep rooted way 
Yeah. yeah. I think that's part of what's so exciting about it is that there isn't a canonical reference point yeah. for me for another painter who's had this particular point of entry consistently over time. Yeah. And I can relate to that sense of disenfranchisement about being in an establishment that didn't necessarily have points of reference for your experience or want to authenticate or validate those experiences. And I think literature being the kind of a language that you use in the same way that Toni Morrison uses yeah. words for you to use color yeah. as those signifiers really does, I think, help um, to explain, I think, for us, the ways in which this is a very unique set of experiences, particularly that women, but black women in particular, have when they come into the canon and need yeah. to intellectualize or validate their presence there, right? Mm -hmm. Like this notion of it having to relate to something prior. Yeah. Um, I was always tempted and, and still am to draw relationships between black American painters in particular that I've known who use color, sometimes who oscillate between figuration and abstraction. And we talked about Mary Lovelace. We think about Bob Thompson. We talk about Robert Colescott because they are also charged. Mm -hmm. And the charge that feels um, that it's coming from color, mm -hmm. I would argue is also a political charge, mm -hmm. right? Because when you are using this language to include yourself, yep. that in and of itself is a very political act and relates back yes. to this idea of agency. Yeah, and I think also about the thing about writing is I was always really into poetry mm -hmm. when I was younger. And when I was like 15 to 17, I was obsessed with Rilke. And I don't know, just this sense of like humanity, but trying to transcend quite sometimes difficult, like. I don't know, experiences that you have as a human and understand them in a broader con context of like be really being connected to yourself, but also others through this experience of art and like, you know, thinking about art as a tool and like a link that we all share and the desire to make and express and like be seen and to be felt and heard and to be acknowledged. Like, I felt like that really for me is what poetry was or what it was trying to do. It was like a very humanist thing. And I was like, I want to make works that are about like the human endeavor to, to like really be known, you know, and to be um, remembered and like held and all of these like very deeply, deeply like personal, but very like easy things to understand, I think. And I was like trying to place that within abstraction. And I was like, oh God, like that's a bit much. But then I was like, I don't know, it makes sense. I feel it makes sense, yeah. I think it, I think it does make sense. And thinking about the moment of you reading Kevin Quashie, I think that's the moment that we really connected was around the sovereignty of quiet and thinking about how even some of those passages are poetic mm. leads me to the other thing that we talked about a lot early on, which I know is important to you, which is music. Yes. Right? So yes. there are multiple ways in which I think music plays itself out for you. And mm. one of them is your desire to and engage us with the notion of the soundtrack mm -hmm. and karaoke, again, a kind of polyvocal way in which you entered the space. Mm -hmm. And I think the other one is the opera that yes. you've recently made. So can you talk to us about both yes. of those things? Yeah. Um, I have always, I always listen to music when I'm painting and I've always been really, um, really interested in how to move outside a solitary practice, which painting is for me, into a more collaborative one. And think, I always think about how inaccessible visual art is for people. And I always want to try and resolve that. I want people to feel like they can come to the work. They don't have to have any knowledge about anything in particular and they can say something about it and they feel invited and encouraged to. And I always felt like music does that in a way that is unparalleled. I feel like maybe the only comparative thing is food, like our relationship to music and food, um, black people specifically, but just like- And the mouth is central to both yeah, of those experiences. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like just, just every human, I felt like there is something where it doesn't, you don't need to explain or educate someone like how they feel about something that they taste or something that they hear. And there's a very bodily, like holistic bodily experience I think we have when you eat or when you listen to music. And there are responses that come. Like when you hear things, sometimes like you want to move or you, you want to cry or like you want to sing. Like 
there's a response from the thing that you're taking in. And I was like, oh, I want to engage with that. Like the response I try to create in the painting is one where I want people to, I want to prompt people to thinking. Like, so the response is an internal one um, and hopefully like a, like a felt one because the color hopefully like ignites some sort of like feeling. But with music, there is like a shared experience that I'm always interested in and how you can cultivate a specific um, mood or gen like you can create uh, a moment in time where we all like connect in a specific way around us around a certain idea and so with the I did a pro black karaoke in 20 21 it was 2020 2020 the end of 2020 2020 um and I got a karaoke machine. It was a project space in West London. It used to be an old chicken shop. And I decorated the space with images of my friends and family, things from nature, musicians, artworks, writers, black intellectuals. I had balloons, full curtains. And basically I sang a set list of songs by black artists and anyone could, sing so members of the public can come and sing my family like all sorts of people came and sung but you could only sing if you were black or identified as black and you could only sing music by black artists or people identified as black and the entire evening was like was recorded and then I when people weren't performing there was a playlist that played in the space and it was a collection of songs that people gave me and recordings of them singing and the whole evening um, was documented sonically and once the performance was over for the night the recording was played in the space on a loop so that then became the the work and from that experience I learned that I am able to express different ideas that exist in the paintings but are sometimes really hard to reach but when you're performing or when you're thinking about sound, there is an immediate connection and that connection can be replicated by inviting someone else to join in. And I felt like that was something I wanted to develop. So last year I produced an opera with a poet and a composer and it was actually based on, uh, the story was based on a text by Gwendolyn Brooks called Maud Martha, which I first discovered from reading Kevin Quash's Sovereignty of Quiet. Yeah. So like this book has been really pivotal in teaching me about ways of developing thoughts that I've had for many, many years, but haven't always known how to articulate or had the confidence to. And so I worked with the composer and the poet Victoria Duquiboli and I, we wrote the libretto, which is the narrative for the opera. And then I worked with Joe, the composer, to come up with the sound, develop the, the story of Maud and what her voice was. And the opera consisted of a soprano who played Maud, a four person choir who were her soul. And then me, I had a narrator's part. I was another aspect of her spirit. And the story is, I don't know how many people have read Gwendolyn Brooks's text, but Maud lives a very ordinary life, but she has an interior life that is exquisite. And the way she looks at things or the value she places on her interior and her outlook is really, really beautifully written by Gwendolyn. And the book consists of lots of chapters that start from her being young to her being married with children. And they're just like stories of her looking at a dandelion or thinking about the porch that she grew up on or talking about the red brick building of her school or going to a dance with her husband, Paul, or just like very ordinary things. And I wanted to write a chapter that could go anywhere in the book where Maud is thinking about rest and what it means to rest. And at the time that I started this, I was very tired. And I think my relationship to painting had become very, um, very much um, like, uh, kind of no longer the escape that it was when you began yeah it wasn't escape it was more of a um, production in a way because the response to the work was so excited I was like oh like I have to I have to be working, like I have to make as much as I can. And it was also like a fear-based response of this might not last. So like I have to try and make as much work as possible. And I realized it was unsustainable, but I didn't know how to stop. And I think the commodification of paintings is like a huge thing I think about. And I was like, I don't want to have that relationship with my work. And I don't want to, um, I don't want to try to, uh, 
work against what is actually very natural to me, which is like painting at my own leisure. So I thought about how can I create a system of care for myself? And I was like, oh, I'll write an opera about it. And then I'll use Maud as a vessel for me. The and so, would be there. yeah, and so Maud was singing to her soul about her life and her soul was trying to get her to understand she needed to rest. And in order to do that, she needed to learn how to breathe. And so that is something that came to fruition in September and it's still being developed now. Like my big goal is to get it to the Royal Opera House. So um, it will happen. It will happen. It will happen. And um, it was an amazing experience because I started to understand like the very specific language I use with sound and music. And I said to Joe, like it's very important we think about um, black music and its relationship to opera because opera and classical music is very much part of black life, but exists in a much more spiritual context, so like the church, right? And so I was like, I want to think about that as a ground for us to engage with the work because there's a very westernized and traditional formal relationship to opera that people think about, but actually it's very rooted in everyday experience and ordinary things. And opera is so over the top. It's all about emotion, like the decadence of telling a story. And so I wanted that and I wanted black music also to sit alongside that. So there were elements of jazz and of blues and of gospel in the opera. And we had singers in the choir who could sing jazz and gospel so that they would do things that came outside of like the, the traditional score and they would like scat or they would free sing. And it was very important that the story of Maud was told for like a very, like, again, like a multiple lens and a layered one. So yeah. It is something that I cannot wait to be able to see. Yes. I cannot wait for us to be able to see it here in the US. Um, but was truly, um, you know, to, to take the format of the book that you'd read and think about just your relationship to music and then to produce the opera, to me marked a different type of artistry. I think that one of the ways in which we think about painters or visual artists is, is that they're limited to doing just that. Yeah. And that becomes the primary language, that becomes the primary way you access all of these emotions or psychic states or statements that you wanna make about life about personal and professional life. And so to step outside of that, I think was not only courageous, but you did it so successfully from everything that I you know, know about it. Um, that again, I think there's this um, tension that you've been exploring. And one of the things that I wonder, before we go back to this body of painting specifically, is whether or not you ever think you'll bring those two together. Ooh. Whether or not you think that the format of the opera or the format of the live music experience, the polyvocal mm. live music experience will ever live alongside these mouths, teeth. Yes, eyes. oh my God, okay, yeah. So this is very funny because I, Gwen, the soprano that performed in the opera, she asked me at the very beginning of the project, she told me that she's doing um, a performance at a festival called Britain Piers, which is in Suffolk. It's like a world renowned kind of um, established classical musical festival. And she's singing um, messianic um, songs. And she asked me if I would consider using my paintings as scenography. Um, and I was like, ooh, yeah, I want to do that. But also I'd never thought about how to pair the visual practice with the sonic practice. And this was an amazing segue. And it seemed really simple because um, it allowed me to think about things that I couldn't do with the opera because we had a very limited budget. So we didn't have set and, you know, there wasn't like lighting and all, all these visual elements you really need for an opera to be everything it is. So... I said yes, and I've, I'm actually working with an animator and a curator together to have my paint, paintings animated, and they'll be the backdrop for the performance um, that happens in June. And we're still working on it, but it's been really interesting to think about the paintings in a way that I haven't before. And the grandeur of the music, like it's kind of, it's in tense but it's it really helped me see the paintings in a different way because I think there is this thing about scale in the work where I th I think the paintings are grand because of their scale and I don't mean that with just the big ones it's the small ones like I think they're really ostentatious and they're quite um intimate at the same time and this thing of like um how much you can 
draw someone in or how much you can ignite a sense of like tactility or like connection or like vastness and like being in awe of something and like being overwhelmed or being kind of um or getting stuck in an image and feeling uncomfortable like all of these things kind of play into how I think about scale and with this experience um working with Gwen and the animator and Cynthia I've been able to look at the paintings in like a different way and understand the impact of scale and sound and how those things like speak to one another or can like feed into one another or, or they can like wrestle with one another. So, yeah. Scale and sound. It's interesting because now I'm coming up with all these, you know, <laughs> words in my brain that absolutely feel specific to you. But the one that is sitting with me now in a different way is spirituality. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about spirituality on a personal level, but um, the way in which you spoke about the opera in particular and Maud's story being one that I remember Gwendolyn Brooks writing about these these small vignettes in which she does reference God. You yeah. know, she does reference the Bible. She does reference her church experience. Um, I, I'm interested a little bit more in, in unpacking this notion of spirituality in the paintings uh -huh. and how you think that's played itself out in the mouths that we see here mm -hmm. before we speak about this particular body of work again. Okay. Um, I think as like a very uh, general rule, I always make from a place of joy. And for me, that is a very spiritual thing. And joy is not happiness. Joy is a foundational um, established relationship with hope, with faith, with love, and those things sustain you. And you have joy in moments of darkness. And those things, I think, are a really incredible way to think about the painting, because for me, they have a tension in them. And I'm interested in exploring both the pleasure of making a painting, both the pleasure of viewing a painting, but also the challenge and how that challenge can be uncomfortable, how it can be aggressive, how it can be dark. I have amazing conversations with children about the work and they're like, oh, I don't like your paintings, they're really scary. And I'm like, this is brilliant, I love that. Because I think there's like an honest reaction to they're responding to the color. It makes them feel uncomfortable and they can't understand the image. And things you can't understand can be really terrifying. And that's like a very um, familiar thing for all of us, but it's definitely applicable to how we respond to one another. And I think as, black, as a black woman, I'm responded to in a very specific way, or I have been throughout my life because people don't understand or don't know how to take the time to understand maybe the way I look, the way I speak, maybe the way I think, yeah. especially if they have an idea, a very imaginary idea of who I am and, and who I am as a representative of all black people, because that's something that happens to us. So I think having all of that exist alongside the, the freedom I feel when I'm painting and the pleasure and gratefulness I have to be able to paint like all of those things coexist and in a spiritual sense I get that um from being joyful like that's how I see joy and it's like the most important part of being an artist for me as well like it's important to come from a, a place of strength that isn't based on quite fleeting things like my emotions change day to day but like I'm always joyful and that is in the work. I think it's in the work. Like I think it comes across. So, and I think you are always joyful. Yeah, I think you are always joyful. Um, joy um, relates to something that this particular body of work mm -hmm. that you you reference Looney Tunes. Yes. Unlike a tooth, unlike teeth, or someone's specific mouth, mm -hmm. this body of work is inspired by both the visual and the sonic language of Looney Tunes. Mm -hmm. I've always seen rhythm in the work. We've yeah. described it as phonetic, but periods of fast, periods of slow. Yep. The Looney Tunes soundtrack is one that's a symphony, right? Like yep. the amazing mm -hmm. symphonies that were composed over a period of 50 years specifically for Looney Tunes. Mm -hmm. So can you speak a little bit about how this particular body of work, Looney Tunes, is it, you know, the Tasmanian devil that we're looking at? Are we looking at Sylvester the cat? Mm -hmm. Who, Mickey Mouse, what were you looking at? And 
who was playing out for you in this particular body of work? Um, I, my first relationship to classical music and abstraction was through cartoons and um, thinking about how bodies really morph and change and forms um, become representative of action or feelings. Um, and I wanted to reference that very clearly in this work. It, well, it's clear for me, it's like a, a shift in trying to create a more literal depiction of mouths and then thinking about what those mouths are saying and what they're doing because there's like a very impassioned and engendered um, relationship, I think, the cartoon, the characters in the cart like cartoons I would watch, that they had to themselves and to others and their environment as well. So this idea of things extending and falling into themselves and like different psychic spaces being um, explored and sound being really important to communicate and to emphasize or to describe. I was like, ah, oh, like this is the sort of stuff why I'm interested in the painting. And I always think about cartoons and I talk about cartoons to people, but I don't ever use it as a reference for anything. Like when I'm looking at my work or like actually making it. So I decided to have reference images and I was copying some of the stills that I'd taken. And actually Cynthia, who I'm working with um, for this performance, she made a visual essay for my long museum catalog. And within that, cause I told her about my relationship to cartoons, she'd made all these like collages of different scenes from cartoons with teeth. And it was amazing the variety of ways that teeth are drawn in cartoons and the sounds they make and the way they move. And I was like, oh my God, like this is the best thing ever. So I was looking at things that she'd like gathered for me and using them as source material. And for me, the paintings are different because of that. Like they have, each painting has like a specific personality. Like some of the mouths are sly, some of them are goofy, some of them are a bit nefarious or like wicked, like ghostly and like phantasmagorical. And some just exist and they just bear all. So. I think like that was something I wanted to do um, because I hadn't been that explicit before in other paintings. And I'd made enough work where I felt like people who maybe had followed my practice would understand the shift and would be able to understand like a different aspect of what it is I'm trying to express or explore. There are two shifts in particular that those of us who've been watching might really be able to point out. I mean, here we have trees. Yes. We have yeah, flowers. Yeah. Uh -huh. We have sun, we our have moon, bricks. we have bricks, yeah. exactly. So we also have shadows. It's the first time I've ever put a shadow in a painting. So let's talk yeah. about it. Yeah. There's just like, a, I want to think about the mouths as bodies. I've always thought about them as bodies in a way, representatives of bodies. But here I want them to be bodies that exist in a space that is both imaginary and real and helps bring people into the context of our world, not just an interior imagined world. And so having trees and flowers, it creates like a different um, like context for things. And the idea that they have, a, the mouths have a physical presence, like they have substance. And so they, they live, like they're alive in a different way. They're not alive because they're made up of color. They're alive because they have spirits and like they're, engaging with the environment like they're engaging with this huge sky and minimal floor or like they're engaging with bricks like I don't know like there's just this thing of them taking up space and inhabiting the space in a way that they weren't before yeah it's interesting because I think the last time I saw them before we shipped them I thought of them as kind of the voice of God mm -hmm. it's like this notion of a, of a mouth that is bigger than mm -hmm. any kind of human scale mouth it had to yeah. be the voice of something that could take over an entire city or landscape or um you know urban or rural scape that it was this very spiritual even you know um heavenly voice in yeah. many ways I feel like they're very mouth. authoritative like even mm -hmm. the small ones like there's this sense of real purpose and intention in them existing and yeah I don't know maybe it's reflective of where I am in my life yeah because I think the works do change depending on like 
what I'm thinking about and what I'm experiencing. And I was surprised by this work. I w when we had a conversation, I came You're gonna get pink and green paintings. Yeah, said. I told her what I was gonna make. And then I started that painting at the back was the very first one I made. And I was really trying to make it a pink, green and red painting. And those colors are in there, but like there's more blue than anything. Yeah. And then I realized, oh, like maybe there's something different that needs to come out. And then I made this one after. So yeah, yeah I was surp I surprised myself really. And it's a beautiful surprise. I think one of the other surprises, and you've already spoken about working on linen, is the negative space. Yep. There are more voids, um, voids that obviously have this relationship to color because of the linen. Mm -hmm. But can you talk a little bit about your choice to have expansive negative space and to place shadow and teeth very specifically, for instance, in this last painting that you made, mm -hmm. um, why that choice was so important and how you see this being a transitional moment in your practice? Yeah, um, I mean, I spoke a little bit about linen before, but I think I really wanted to challenge myself. Like I'm always interested in the works developing. Like I never want to repeat something. And so I was like, well, I want to use space differently and I want the linen to become a really instrumental part of the space and for it to ignite and sort of charge the painting. So I didn't want emptiness. So that's why it was important I use linen because of the color and it provided like this layer for me to work on where the colors interact with the space that there is in a way that I hadn't thought about before. Um, and yeah, I don't know, like it's something that's very recent. So I haven't really fully grasped maybe what it means, but the more I made the work, the more confident I, I got in leaving space. So these two paintings are the last ones that I made and they have the most space in them because I wanted to challenge the idea of like what is important in the painting and like where you place color and how it might also charge the em like the empty areas in the work and the idea that the shapes become way more crucial when there's a lot of linen visible and the way that the the color and the patterns sort of function becomes a lot more like potent and I realized that I could push that in a way that maybe I hadn't done in the first couple of paintings that I'd made. Um, so I gained confidence in making this work as I was making it. And you and I have spoken about, basically I, I made all these paintings in four months, which is like a very short period of time. And I made more things that haven't been hung, like smaller works. And But we we edited things down and we're like, this is a presentation we wanna, we wanna make. But I realized towards the end of making the paintings that these two works really are the start of like a new body of work. And if I had time, I would paint like this and say if I'd had a year to make paintings, the whole show would probably be paintings like this. So this show has really been a show of transitioning and I've never had a show like that before in this way. And there's a real journey and process that I was going through whilst I was making. Even the idea that I was like, oh, I'm gonna make these types of paintings and I didn't. Mm. And I think I had to learn things about the way um, I instinctually want to paint and the way that I think sometimes I'm painting or want to paint. And they became aligned in a, in a very serendipitous process of allowing myself to just follow my nose, but then also understand that I can take risks in the work. And this was like me taking a, a risk and it's very different to the other works, but I felt like this is like a new language and I've never made a painting like this. So it was exciting for me to realize I could get to that point from that work at the back. So yeah, like it's been really important for me to make these works. I, um, we have a few more minutes before we mm -hmm. have the audience ask questions, but I think that, you know, you've talked about wanting in the past to make things ugly and grotesque. Oh, yeah. I still think they're gorgeous. Yeah. I still think they are sublime in their own way. And these two in particular, that you've really pushed the boundaries of your own language. Mm -hmm. You are using both the negative space, the trees, 
the forms of nature that we recognize and the urban scape simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself, this transition that you're making, I think will challenge the vernacular that you've used yes. in a different way. I mean, the red remains, but I think these blues and purples yeah. are something yeah. that we started to talk about. The brown that really started to emerge as a part of this particular body of work. Yes. Just to round us out, can you talk about how that color palette, yep. alongside the decision to include more of these specific elements that we recognize mm -hmm. from nature and from the urban scape, mm -hmm. how that plays itself out, you think, moving forward with this changing color palette? Ooh, I feel like it's very easy for me to make paintings with red. Like, it's very hard for me not to make a painting with red and yellow as well. Like when I started making work, I love color, but, and I thought I didn't have many biases between like certain mm. colors, but I do. And I don't like um, working with green, turquoise, purple, orange, and brown. <laughs> so, Hence, they're all in the painting behind yeah, us. Yeah, so there are certain things, um, I let myself have fun and luxuriate in what is very like easy and pleasurable um, with certain paintings like this one. I'm like, oh, I can make that really easily. Like I understand like how those colors work together, what I want to do to make it a little bit ugly. Like th this makes sense to me, like in a very um, uh, different way to this painting making sense to me. Like I had to, work differently to get to the point I did with this work and this one and there had to be a lot more intention with how I use the color and I wanted to I always all the colors that I basically every painting has every color possible but I don't often use the colors that I don't like as the foundation for the painting and I don't often use them as the key to the painting because I think certain colors act as keys. And I wanted to try to shift my relationship to these colors and how I viewed them because they're very important. And I felt like the more time I spent with them, the more I understood what relationship they have to the colors I find a lot more easy to work with. And they both need to exist. So... I think with this work, um, I, it made me really uncomfortable when I was making it. And it is still a work that I think other people will probably find uncomfortable. Um, maybe if you've seen my other paintings, I think it's exciting, but like it's, it's challenging because it's not the, the language I normally use to communicate. And because of that, it's really important and I want to pursue that more because that's how, that's how the narrative, I feel like these are narrative paintings. I think that's how the narrative grows and the narrative of the colors as well grows with the work. So yeah, I think it's like the beginning of something important. Absolutely, yeah. and I think the, the title of the show, mm -hmm. which is five exclamation points, yep. really encapsulate the series of responses that one might have to them, mm -hmm. to the change, to the shifts, this kind of, amazement this wow this bang boom I didn't expect it mm -hmm. um, in the best possible way I think mm -hmm. it's evolution it's growth it's necessary for you as an artist and yep. it's necessary for us as an audience um, following a practice to be able to evolve our language mm -hmm. and our ways of seeing yep. alongside you so I am grateful to Thank have been you. a part of witnessing this yep. transition in your work and both in terms of the linen and the language that you're using to um, speak to us about these notions of agency and interiority. So I thank you. Thank you. We have a few more minutes. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ooh, my alarm's about to go off We're right on time. Oh, great. <laughs> I was just uh, wondering, when you, <clears throat> do you already visualize what the image what the, the painting is going to be before you start mm -hmm. in your abstract work? Mm -hmm. You already know what it's going to be or you have an idea of what it's going to be or do you just start painting and it develops? I just start painting and then it develops. And that's the same with the small paintings and the larger ones. 
The smaller ones are a bit different because they're very different texturally, like they're very layered normally. So they take longer to make, like for the image to materialize. But with the larger works um, and the smaller works, it's just me applying color and then just going off and seeing what happens. It's like connecting dots. Like the more I do, the more I understand and then the more the image appears. So it's like a very, um, very, I suppose, surprising experience. Um, and it also means that it takes time for me to really appreciate what I've done. Because I think when you're working that way, well, when I'm working that way, it means I can't look in the way that I'm looking at the work now because I'm seeking something. And so that means the way I'm looking is like finding and like working things out and problem solving and imagining. But the way that I'm looking now is like, this exists, so what do I see? Like, what have I made? And that's why it's important to exhibit for me because there are different relationships to looking and understanding the work. Like you understand through making, but that type of um, knowledge is different to the knowledge I get from looking at the work in this context. So yeah, everything is very um, process led and like intuitive. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh. I'm just curious, when you, exper when you experience an emotion, uh, do you experience it in color? Um, and is it like an intense color? So when you feel something about to come on emotionally, um, do you see like the change or the intensity in color? And how has that informed how you just experience life or engage with people? Yeah. Ooh. Um, Use uh, the word synthesis, yeah. Yeah, synthesis, yeah. yeah. I don't have that. I have more of a... Uh, mm, when I look at paintings that I really like, I describe them as like wanting to to lick them or like eat them. I have a more, um, yeah, I don't know. This is more, I'm obsessed with the with mouth. With the mouth, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a much more bodily reaction. Like I feel like I'm very, I'm very sensitive as in like I'm attuned to my emotions and that generates um, a very good understanding of how to, express them through color so it's not that i see things in color it's more that i can i can describe an emotion through the tension in two colors or the um like the sweetness in two colors it's like i think about the colors in more of that way and the way i feel um and yeah i don't know like that is that's exciting because it means that i'm always trying to forge a new expression, like to describe what I'm feeling. And the paintings really are meant to be, they're like an attempt to express a self that I have. And that self is really layered and really complicated and is always changing. And so each painting is like an attempt to do that. And um, yeah, like it will take a lifetime, but I feel like even though I've been only making this work for four years or something, five years, I can look at them and be like, ooh, like I know how I was feeling at that time. Like these works are so different to the last body of work. Like, there's a lot more like expansion and like a, like a taking up of space. Like, um, and they feel really, um, they feel really interested and excited in themselves. Like they feel like they, like they are aware of their existence and the importance of it. And I feel like that's how I feel. It's taken me a while to get to a place where I'm like, oh, I understand who I am as an artist. And I know I have confidence in my voice and my language as an artist. And I have so much to learn, but there's like so much that I do know and I'm confident in a way that I wasn't before. And that is in the painting. And I think like, yeah, it's more, yeah, it's more like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have a comment and then a question, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, <clears throat> I find your work incredibly, for me, liberatory. Mm -hmm. And um, 
On Monday, I was having a conversation with a bunch of other artists about an experience I had. And um, I was taking an economics course at Mills College, which is a liberal, if you're going to pick up what they're putting down, women's college. And um, when I was there, there was um, someone that posted to a monitored um, site. And these were the exact words. The black women on the Mills campus are too loud. They ought to shut up. And they ought to be lynched. Black, happy Black History Month. This was about 10 years ago. And um, I didn't realize until I got into here that I was carrying that trauma. And you were talking about internality. And, um, but the joy of this work, um, and at first I met them with an abstract eye, and then I saw the mouths. Yeah. And then I said, yes, girl, loud, yeah. and, loud. <laughs> and proud. Loud. Loud and proud. Um, because, you know, I don't know any loud black women, but a lot of other people seem to. So I just, it was so, so amazing. And I just want to say, I just, I got this sense of vertigo mm -hmm. from, from this work. So it was absolutely... We were dancing during install. That's what you felt. <laughs> yeah. And, but it was this sense of, you know, something being displaced. But I'm curious um, how you and Aaron... You said there was a lot more work. How did you pare it down? How do you make the choices, these um, specific choices? Thank you. Um, yeah, just, just to what you said, it's really interesting because part of the reason I use colour the way I do is to be obnoxious and to be very clearly like obnoxious with the way I use colour. And it is speaking to this thing about being... I've had so many experiences where I've been told I'm loud or too quiet. We, when we were here in July, oh my God, a woman in the gallery told me and Erin we were making too much noise. We were sitting here, yeah, uh -huh. plotting out the space. Yeah. And they're visitors to a black Venus exhibition that was about black women's yeah. bodies. Uh -huh. And they simultaneously told us we were too loud. And then when I said, okay, hold on, I'm a curator, she's an artist you know, in the space because we have an exhibition that's going to open here. I want to say 10 minutes later, one of the same people, a couple, who had shut us up, came back and asked a question about the work. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, it was very gracious. I tried to be because yeah. I was coming back. Yeah. But there was a part of me that was like, you could leave because we weren't that loud. We spend time in museums. Mm. We were just hearing each other. And I think there was an assumption that they had the power to tell us in this space how to behave because we must not know how to behave. Because if we'd known how to behave, we wouldn't be saying anything at all. And it's really interesting that you can be in a space that you feel like you have control over as a woman, as a black person. You know, I would think that being in this space would mean that people would think twice, at least, before they said to two black women, shut up, mm -hmm. or you're too loud. And that is, it's, it's mm, you yeah. continue with that. Yeah, part, or I just I think have. it's like one of the things that when you come to the work, like you're being um, confronted, mm -hmm. and like that's the point. And I think like, yes, there are really specific experiences that we all have that I um, consciously subconsciously aware of being part of the process of making the paintings. Um, but I think the thing about um, being in this space, I was really interested in, I wanted to make things that took up room because I've been working on a very small scale for about a year and a half. So I spoke with Erin and we figured out the best use of the space. And I was like, okay, well, I think I'm going to make big paintings and I can only make things up to a certain scale because of the size of my studio. Um, and so this is the biggest size I can get to. And um, I felt like once I'd spoken to Erin about the number of works I was thinking of making, 
um, we would have conversations and I would send her pictures of the paintings as I was making them. So she understood the direction the work was going in. And then when we came to the time of installing, like prior to that, we'd had a look at all of the work and we thought about what is the relationship between the paintings? What are they saying? How are they different? And what dialogue, what story do we want to tell by how we install it? And for me, Erin and I really struggled with the smaller works because there were more of them and we didn't know like which of them we should use to ignite, but also I think um, kind of challenge some of the things that are happening in the larger paintings. And so I I kind of let Erin um, pick yeah what I would there was one I was like we have to have and it's the black one in yeah. the middle I think we both agree that yeah that yeah had to be yeah I mean it's it's interesting to Rachel's point I mean what was so important was that this transition in her painting practice was going to lead the exhibition mm -hmm. for me once I saw the things all in studio it was the idea that this was a transitional moment in her practice that I wanted to make sure we prioritized because museum spaces should be one of experimentation. They should be one of risk. They should be one where you're playing out a new set of ideas. And so we wanted to prioritize these large works and give them as much space to be seen and interrogated as was possible. And one of the decisions we made the day we were told to shut up was to kind of create a smaller truncated viewing experience. So the gallery itself goes a little further back, but what Rachel and I both understood was that we wanted you to have one sight line to see everything simultaneously. And so for me, that meant the polyvocal experience was not just the sixth mouths, but that there are at least nine that you're hearing and seeing in this kind of liberatory chorus, right? All encapsulating, you know, all around you at once. Um, I think for Rachel, part of what we talked about was the ambulatory experience as well, right? That you wanted to be able to move around them. We wanted you to be able to move around them and between them and to be able to see the shifts as you looked across the paintings themselves and to be able to think about, and even for us, kind of count how many teeth you can see and think through how much of this was landscape, how much of this was an oral scape. And so paring down the smaller works was something that, felt in many ways inevitable once we were here and really had already made the decision to focus on what we knew was a pivotal point in her practice and wanted to make that the debut exhibition here yeah. um, in the US, so. Yeah. And I love, I mean, this isn't a minimal hang, but like I love a minimal hang, so. Spacious hang. Spacious hang, yeah. so um, I knew that I didn't want there to be too many things in this space. So it was important that people have room because I think the works are quite a lot to take in mm -hmm. and um, I want people to take their time as well. So it's like there has to be space, like physical space for people to do that. So, yeah. Yep, there's one question in the back and I, I want to say that in her last show, there was a piece that was nine meters long. So, you know, nine meters for us is about, I don't know, times it by four, right? So about almost 40 feet long. Oh, wait, is this a Hayward painting? Yeah. Oh, no, that was seven. Seven. Oh, seven. Yeah, 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 yeah. Seven. But still, I mean, the length almost of this, this wall. And so, you know, making those choices early on, even about how the space would be used and making each one of these distinct pieces was something that I think from the minute we were here last July thinking about use of space, um, yeah. to predetermined a lot of the rest. Yeah, the way I work is always site specific. So I made these paintings for this space. Like I never just have paintings in the studio I put into a show. And I always think from the very beginning, how many paintings do I need to make? What kind of scale do they need to be? So I started with like a very clear intention. Uh -huh. So in the back. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is And I is think Martin. this is our last question, guys. Um, I just want to say I'm tremendously inspired tonight, and I just love what you said at the beginning about um, challenging the status quo with pastels. I've been using pastels since I was five years old, and some of these are incre incredibly emotionally charging. I even was staring at one and found myself tearing up a little bit just out of nowhere, and I just want to like to thank you for your creativity and ask you what um, some of the challenges of using pastels were and how you overcame them in this process. Ooh, that's a good question. Great question. Yes, yes. Um, challenges. Let's see. Some of them, sometimes when I'm using pastel, yes, um, 
there's like I don't always know like how they're going to react on the surface and they don't always do what I want them to do but I never try to change their inherent materiality. So some of the pastels are very dry and resistant. So they take a lot of energy to spread. Um, others are more translucent. And when light hits them, I would describe them as weak, like they don't have much substance. And others, um, they're like butter, like they just melt, they're, they're lovely. So I think one of the things I have learned is important is honoring the material and working with it instead of trying to work against it or make it do something which is inherently different to its purpose. And one of the great things about the pastels is like the vivacity of color, like they're so um, pure in their color and intense that I feel like the thing that I try to focus on is drawing on that and using that as the thing that um, will communicate what I want. So if a pastel isn't doing what I want, then I try to use it in a way where there's an isolated and very specific function for it in the painting. So this one, the green, is really difficult to work with but I wanted there to be green in the paint. I actually wanted there to be a lot more green in the painting, but there isn't because it was too difficult. So I started to think about, okay, well, how will I use this and what role will it play? It needs to be a very specific one because I can't physically exert myself using this color. And so it became a tooth. And then after that, I was like, oh, okay, well, the one beneath, I need to have something that will complement the green. So that's why the one beneath is red. And everything else in the picture is like blue, purple, pink, brown. Like it's a very specific tonal um, relationship going on in this painting. And I think I've learned to use the things that are challenging as um, like a moment uh, that is special or like as a gift is something that I can use um, to create like an off moment or like a weird moment or like a moment of difference in the work. So I try to work with them that way when they're challenging. If there are no other questions, okay, we'll take it. Thank you. Two minutes. Okay, I'll keep this short. So um, I loved your collection. Um, I'm, I'm personally a, an engineer, so I tend to sometimes look at art and be really lost. So I, I really appreciate there was a moment when you were speaking where you mentioned the teeth. I'm like, oh my God, I can see it now. Oh, okay. Um, but otherwise, I think to your point, you'd mentioned that I mostly saw landscapes. But you know, my question then, to not you know keep carrying on, I'm sorry, I'm gushing, but... Um, you talked about how you know a lot of I think the themes of your work are of the body and are visceral. So you mentioned that you'd had drawings of the hands, of the eyes, and now of course these collections of the mouth. And I was curious if you were interested in pursuing other physical manifestations of the senses. So the nose, particularly the bridge, the ears, and how that speaks to the history of black women and how we are misunderstood and how perhaps our features are not um, considered you know, those of the status quo and then those deviations of the status quo then make them inferior and make them scary or make them unappreciated for what they are and also how we adorn these features and how that is also misinterpreted as something that should be quieted or it's too loud or it's not blending in or towing the line with what uh, the convention is of our society. Thank you. Oh, yes. Okay, so I think with the eyes and the mouth, like, I started working with them because they um they could symbolize very specific experiences or like emotional states I'd been in um and um I feel like instead of other body parts there are other things in the world that I would like to use as symbols um and in these paintings, I don't really understand the symbols that I've started to use that are new. So like the bricks and the trees and shadows, like that was a surprise to me. Um, but I think like I want to broaden the lexicon that I have of um, the way I'm thinking about things and speaking about things. And sometimes they're rooted in very intentional desires and other times they're more um, like, 
instinctual because of the process of making the work. I'm like, oh, this needs to become a symbol. Like the circle, like it's not a sun or a moon. It's just like a circle. I don't understand that either. So I think there are things that with time, I will start to understand about why I'm drawn to certain things. Um, something that I was doing alongside eyes and mouth when I was at school was making um, put, like paintings of dogs and they're really important, but I haven't spent time doing that. So I feel like that would be the next challenge. And dogs' mouths, like that's a big thing. Um, because again, like really multifaceted in like what they mean to people, um, the expressions that dogs' um, mouths like mean to me. But I think also this idea of um, violence and threat and um, like fragility, like bodily fragility when it's encountering a threat. Like I'm interested in those things. And this thing about Erin said about me wanting to make ugly paintings, I am really um, always trying to get to a point with the painting where people are really challenged and like really um, drawn to the work, not because it's beautiful, but because it's uncomfortable. Because I think inherently as humans, we are enamored with things that we don't like, or we have a relationship with things that we don't understand or don't like, that we don't acknowledge. And it's actually a very important part of our lives because it's to do with like survival instincts and like fear responses and anxiety and protection and vulnerability, like all of these things that we don't like to engage with. It's to do with like ideas around death and like health and strength and like stuff that is really part of um, our psyche in a way that is quite embedded and hidden in our day-to-day -day life, but comes out, I think, in certain instances in really triggering and confusing ways. And like that is as much a part of the work as um, like really excited explorations of self and things that are a little bit more celebratory and like hopeful. And so I feel like I want to develop a symbolic language for that in the work. Cause I think the little, little tiny bits of it, but not in enough, not as much as I want. So yeah. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you so much for your attention and your time. Rachel, thank you thank so you. much for the exhibition. Thank you so much. Nia. I want to thank both of you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Erin, for this inspiring um, and exciting conversation. I hope everyone here continues to come back to the museum, spend more time with the exhibitions, come to our future programming. And this is one of the many programs that we host here at the museum. So please visit our website, moadsf.org, to learn more. Um, I also invite you to consider becoming a member, making a donation to support the work that we do here at MOAD. Your ticket today can go towards a member, so membership, so please visit our website to learn more about that. And lastly, we love to hear from you. There are uh, QR codes with a program survey on your seats. So please take a few moments following this event to share your thoughts and feedback. We love to hear from you and it really helps us know how to best support our communities. So thank you all and I hope you have a good evening. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.